Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Dulce Garcia. I'm the Executive Director of Border Angels, and I'm very excited today for this talk with Alex Montoya. Um, thank you, Alex, for being with us on this uh, series today. Thank you for having me. So um, first of all, I want to thank you for reaching out uh, about this very, um, very special topic for us. Um, I, we were part of a, a conversation with other very knowledgeable people in another talk about microaggressions and uh, inclusivity. And um, you pointed out, well, what about this voice, this very important voice that is being left out. And so I, I am very thankful to you, Alex, to be with us today to add on to your voice to this discussion. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and introduce you if it's okay with you, Alex. Um, Alex, Alex Montoya is a thought leader who has written eight books, including children, children's uh, book about inclusion. His company, A Motivational Communications, creates inspiring in-person and virtual talks. In 2020, he also launched the Alex Montoya podcast and the Alex Montoya Foundation to celebrate disability and immigrant communities. He has won a Lifetime Achievement Award from the San Diego Hispanic Chamber, was given a Medal of Honor from the Colombian government, and carried the Olympic torch in 1996. Alex has delivered his message for audiences, including Google, NASA, Harvard, and the NFL's Denver Broncos. Alex earned his bachelor's degree at the University of Notre Dame and a master's from the University of San Francisco. In addition to creating his own foundation, Alex is on the board of directors for the Gurmanian Foundation, which supports people with disabilities in San Diego and Tijuana. A native of Medellin, Colombia, Alex immigrated as a youth to San Diego. California, where he resides. And I got to say, if you haven't picked up one of Alex's books, uh, in particular, the children's book, which is very cute, you should. <laughs> you definitely should. Um, Alex, thank you again for being with us and, and, and talking about at this intersection of immigration and inclusion today. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dulce. And as I've said many times before, uh, I am so inspired by your work and the voice that you lead uh, for our community. So uh, for me to be here uh, speaking with you today is just an incredible honor. You're an incredible friend. And um, I'm just glad that we can uh, bring this perspective to light today. So thank you for that. So with that, um, what I'd like to do today is just kind of uh, explain to everyone out there, and thank you for those who logged in, that <clears throat> really our main objective today is to show a couple different things. Um, as you mentioned, the... Uh, perspective of specifically people with disabilities is oftentimes lost in the overall um, discussion on diversity. Um, it's it's not a new thing. Uh, it's not a um, uh, kind of a random or haphazard thing. Uh, it, it tends to be uh, pretty pretty regular that um, we tend to look at disability. I'm sorry, we tend to look at diversity through the lenses oftentimes of gender or ethnicity, or sexual orientation, or any number of things. And more often than not, um, disability gets forgotten. That especially becomes problematic when we uh, are talking about immigration and immigration rights, because so many um, are not realizing that for, for so many of us, um, there is that extra layer of being an immigrant, but also having disability or medical issues. Uh, aligned with your situation, with your life. And so today I, I want to kind of illuminate um, uh, what that looks like and also why it's important moving forward uh, and how people can play a role in being allies to make sure um, that everyone receives the uh, human rights and equal justice um, that they deserve. So um, with that, I'd like to tell a little bit of my uh, story uh, just so people can kind of uh, get a little bit of context. Um, I am a writer and a speaker uh, located here in beautiful San Diego. Uh, I live in the East Village uh, section of, of downtown. And um, I recognized at a really young age, probably ever since I was 10 years old, let's say, which was many moons ago, um, that I had a story that was very unique uh, to, to 
uh, to most people. Um, 47 years ago, in, in 1974, uh, I was born in Medellin, Colombia. And uh, my family uh, had a very hardworking mother and father, uh, an older brother and older sister. And um, they were all surprised when I was born with disability. Uh, in the early 70s, uh, there was a whole generation of us that, uh, that were born um, with, uh, with birth defects. Uh, there was a medicine by the name of thalidomide uh, that was out in the market um, that was regarded as being extremely safe and extremely um, uh, usable for, for, especially for expectant mothers who were fighting morning sickness. What they didn't know and of course, this was uh, the era long before cable TV, long before uh, internet, long before the information age, when it just took longer for the word to get out about things. Um, so a whole generation of us were born with birth defects. And in my situation, I was born missing both of my arms and my right leg. Um, my parents decided that they were going to go contrary to what most people in Latin America viewed at that time as kind of their view on disability. Instead of um, uh, ostracizing me or, or kind of putting me away or instead of coddling me and trying to do everything for me, they really wanted to empower me. And they really wanted to make sure that my life was viewed uh, as much of a blessing as their other two kids' lives. So um, when I was two years old, uh, I had the opportunity to come to the United States and be fitted for prosthetics. Um, missing both of my arms and missing uh, my right leg, uh, I was a triple amputee from birth. And um, if I didn't have prosthetics, I literally would not have any way to move around, get around, hold things. Uh, I was truly completely dependent on other people. And my parents recognized uh, early on that from the neck up, I was just a regular kid. Uh, as my mom likes to say, uh, I wouldn't shut up. I wouldn't stop talking. And uh, she knew that uh, there had to be some way to, to be able to uh, tap into that potential and just give me the life that every youth deserves. So when I was two years old, uh, with my mother, I visited the United States. Uh, I visited a, uh, a, uh, a hospital uh, in San Francisco by the name of Shriners Hospital. Uh, now Shriners has a chain of hospitals or an affiliation of hospitals and burn centers all across the United States where um, they help um, either kids who have orthopedic needs or kids who are burn victims. And they um, bring them from all over the world and all over uh, South America and all over Central America to uh, take care of their needs for free. Um, what they did for me was provide some surgeries that kind of helped stabilize uh, my joints. And they provided uh, my prosthetic arms, just like the two that I'm wearing today, and a prosthetic leg. And that was a newfound sense of freedom for me. All of a sudden, in the course of one day of receiving my prosthetics, I could walk and I could move and I could hold things and I could grab things. And it was a brand new sense of empowerment. It was everything my parents dreamed. So because of that, um, the decision was made for me to move to the United States permanently when I was four years old and move in with family members that we already had here um, uh, living in the U.S. Uh, it was a very hard decision. It was much harder on my parents than it was for me uh, just because I was so young. I really didn't know what was going on at the time, um, but I recognized that that was a major, major sacrifice on my parents' part. Now, to give you a story or an example, uh, an illustration of, of what it's like to be in this country and, and be an immigrant who had to relearn the language. My first language was Spanish. Um, had to learn English, had to learn all of the customs, all the traditions, and then to also be someone with three prosthetics who uh, was oftentimes uh, stared at or pointed at uh, or was very much made to feel like the other uh, whenever whenever I would go out public. Um, I'll give you this illustration. Um, many, many years after I had received uh, my prosthetics and I had 
uh, gone to school here in San Diego. By the time I was in high school, uh, I went to a uh, summer camp uh, that um, that was actually located in Arizona, in the mountains of Arizona. And uh, we arrived there um, by bus. And um, I'll never forget how uh, the immediate reaction as soon as I arrived was, in my mind, I'm already thinking of what I can do, what I might need help with, what I might need some assistance with, but I'm excited. I'm excited to be there. And as soon as I stepped off the bus to get onto the campgrounds, the camp director walks up to me and looks at me and says, wow, wow, I wish you weren't here. I wish you weren't here. And I'll never forget the stinging sensation that those words provided and how his words just burned through my skin and burned through my soul because it was the last thing that I expected. I I didn't think that by this time, which was about 1991, that those types of attitudes existed and that someone was going to be so open and so overt about it. Uh, but those were literally his words. I wish you weren't here. And I was very fortunate that some other camp counselors heard it and walked up to him and said, don't worry, sir, we got this, he's gonna be okay, we'll take care of him. Uh, and he said, well, I don't want, I don't want for you guys to baby him this week. I don't want for you guys to have to just take care of him the whole week. And my response to that was, don't worry, no one will have to baby me, no one wants to take care of me. I'll require some assistance uh, along the way, but I know that I am fiercely independent and that I will do my best to make sure that I have a fun, enjoyable, uh, camp experience and I won't prevent anyone else from having an enjoyable camp experience. What that showed me was that there was very much a ignorance about people with disabilities. The Americans with Disabilities Act had just passed. It was sweeping new legislation that was landmark civil rights legislation for people with disabilities. But it made me realize that I really had um, kind of two separate issues that I was, uh, for lack of a better word, straddled with. I was an immigrant and I was a person with a disability and I really needed to work on educating people as much as possible on what that meant. Now, I was very fortunate that um, I was able to make it through camp. I made it through uh, the week, I made it through the school year and I eventually became the first person in my family uh, to graduate from college. My life has really been dedicated to showing people, number one, that um, people with disabilities uh, belong here, that people who are immigrants belong here, that we have uh, things that we want to contribute to this country and that we want to contribute to our society as much as anyone else, um, and that people should not be scared of, of those sorts of um, uh, challenges or issues. The main reason that I bring this up though is because of this, Dulce. It's hard to pinpoint an exact number, but I know based on my experience and based on my peers that I saw that there are hundreds of thousands of people, if not more, that come through our borders each year that have a medical need as much as they have say an economic need. And in my view, the story of the United States and the purpose of the United States is to have as much mercy and compassion for those needs as much as anything else. When we talk about asylum and we talk about why people leave their home countries, again, just like the, just like the diversity discussion, disability and medical need oftentimes gets overlooked. And so what I want to do today is just remind people that you have a whole segment, a whole segment of the population that comes to this country for disability needs and medical needs as much as socioeconomic needs. When we talk about DEI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and when we talk about uh, border issues, uh, particularly uh, case in point when we talked about um, all of the kids who uh, were in the, uh, uh, the, the, the centers 
and, and the cages along the southern border. Even without hearing this confirmed on the news, I knew, I knew that I knew as soon as I saw the number of kids and the number of families that were there, I knew that there had to be kids with disabilities there. And so for me, it was particularly infuriating because I knew that not only did you have just this massive group of people, but you also had kids with disabilities who I would argue are probably even a little more helpless or need a little more assistance than your average child. And so all of this is to say that I hope that we can continue um, to look at um, disability as part of the, the lens of immigration and part of the reason uh, for immigration and to be prepared and to be equipped uh, so that we don't let uh, kids with special needs, kids with developmental disabilities, kids with um, uh, physical disabilities, any of that uh, slip through the cracks. I'll finish with this. I am extremely happy to tell you that at the end of my week of summer camp, at the very end of the week after a week of making wooden instruments and singing campfire songs and learning the rugged ways of the outdoors and camping and hiking and doing all of that, <clears throat> excuse me, the camp director, the very same camp director who greeted me with, I wish you were here, came up to me and said, Alex, I want to thank you. I want to thank you because you show me a whole new side of a camper. I've never had a camper with a disability. And my immediate thought was fear. My immediate thought when I saw you was to be fearful, fearful of liability and fearful that you weren't going to make it through the week. But I learned so much from seeing you get through this week that I apologize and I want to say thank you for being with us at this camp. People with disabilities have that ability to educate and transform and show a whole different perspective on life, just as immigrants in general have the potential to show people a brand new perspective and a brand new way of viewing life in addition to however else we may contribute to society. So that's really all that we're asking for is to have the chance to be acknowledged, to be seen, to be recognized, to know that our needs uh, may be a little more complex or a little more specific than your average person's need, uh, but they are certainly no less valuable. And if that is if that is paid attention to and that is regarded, then we can contribute to society and truly make this the greatest country in the world. Thank you for letting me share my story. Oh my goodness. Thank you for sharing that, Alex. Um, thank, thank you for being vulnerable and, and telling us about this story. And um, I feel like, like that uh, person in the camp, um, we often fear each other consistently, you know, uh, uh, fearing each other because we don't have these dialogues. So I very much appreciate you being a part of this conversation. Um, our mission at Border Angels is to provide direct humanitarian aid, but it's also to advocate, to educate people. And, and so that's why we're really thankful uh, that you are offering that opportunity for us to learn from you. Um, it, it's, it's been quite a journey to be actively aware of the times that we might think we're inclusive but really are leaving people behind voices um, that we don't want to hear because we're afraid of that. Um, in, in the work that we do, we, we do work with uh, migrants that have suffered um, just, uh, an, an, an event that led them to lose a limb, for example, when they're riding um, the trains. You know, we've, we've uh, supported people and met people in the encampment that was formed uh, at El Chaparral, right at our at the point of entry with the U.S. in Tijuana. And um, this one person in particular had lost both limbs due to uh, riding La Bestia, one of the trains on his way up to the U.S. And so the U.S. is very good at selling this idea. You know, we have this American dream here and, you know, this is the land of hope and, you know, a beacon of hope for, for so many. But, but then along the journey, 
you know, a number of people uh, become ill. It, they go through a very treacherous uh, journey if, if they even make it. Uh, many people perish and die. Uh, so our work is very much to reduce the amount of deaths as people are crossing, in um, particular through the desert and the mountains, but uh, also uh, support the people that are in the shelters in Tijuana and, and here in, in, in the U.S. California has been quite progressive in the assistance that is provided uh, in our local communities. But generally speaking, when it comes to our immigrant community, we are left out. Um, if, if we're undocumented specifically, we're definitely left out of resources. And so it's important to advocate on this issue because there is this intersection on uh, work with disability and work with immigration laws. Um, in the encampment, uh, we, we met a number of children that had medical disabilities. And so in forming an alliance with other organizations like AFSC, Borderline Crisis Center, Apala San Diego, Psicólogos Sin Fronteras, Unified U.S. Deported Veterans, we were able to file almost a thousand applications uh, prioritizing people with disabilities um, knowing that Tijuana was not a safe space for these migrants asking for a, a, a chance to survive, uh, knowing that many of them were indigenous people that didn't even speak Spanish fu fully or were from other countries. Um, Black migrants in particular became uh, very vulnerable. Um, and so we were filing these humanitarian paroles applications for them to be a part of the, uh, at that point, the very small window of opportunity to cross. And we were successful in almost a thousand applications. But as you mentioned, Alex, thousands more were left behind. The window closed for us and we weren't able to continue filing these applications for them. And so we have in Tijuana in the, the 17 shelters that we support hundreds of people with a number of, of, of um, di different abled uh, migrants seeking asylum and, and they're being left out. And so if we want a world that is more inclusive, that is more, as you mentioned, compassionate, we definitely have to uh, include them when, and when decisions are being made in DC, for example, when policy is being made uh, in, in Sacramento, in California. Um, and so we're no longer able to file these applications right now for the people that are asking for asylum in Tijuana. And so it's heartbreaking because, you know, they call us up and they say, well, you know, we heard you were able to help this person. Why can't you help me? And that, that opportunity is closed. And I imagine that happens often, right? Um, we, it feels like we take a step forward and then a few steps back when it comes to immigration in particular. Um, so what can we do um, about this, you know, now you're 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 telling us your story, Alex. You're making us aware of this issue. What can can someone do from across mm. the country to support uh, both both uh, migrants, to support asylum seekers, to support people with disabilities? What can someone do? Yes, well, I believe that the most important thing, um, both for migrants and people with disabilities in general is if you are not specifically a member of that community, is to be an ally. To really know that um, my friend, my coworker, my schoolmate, uh, just even my fellow community member, um, if he or she or they fall into those categories, they probably have a very um, different and challenging route. Um, number one, just to get to this country, and number two, just in their daily, day-to-day -day, uh, walk and um, uh, lifestyle. Um, it's hard, it is, it is hard. And the only way that you're going to ever know uh, how hard it is, uh, and it's, it's kind of a good overall rule of thumb, is to basically say, gosh, what is it like to spend a day in that person's shoes and to be the best ally possible? I am a firm believer to say in two things. Number one, um, that social movements in this country don't really become social movements until people that are not directly affected by something speak up. And that goes for any group. So in other words, when any group whatsoever is fighting for their rights and fighting for equality, um, there usually is not traction and progress made unless the people outside of that group start caring and start advocating for them and start saying, 
yes, we want to see that person mobilized as well. So when people not directly affected start caring and really start serving in the role as allies, then you start to see change happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second thing is I'm also a firm believer that when it comes to change in this country and when it comes to uh, progress and equality, more often than not, it comes through our youth. And for any youth that may be uh, watching today, uh, I really want them to know how invaluable and how crucial their efforts are. Uh, I believe the youth of this country are the ones that generally um, have the most passion and the most drive and, and maybe um, aren't uh, encumbered by all of the um, adulting responsibilities uh, that, that, you know, kind of slow a lot of us down. Um, and youth know how to mobilize. Youth are always the ones that are at the forefront of technology. And they know how to get the word out and how to get awareness out. So if you are a youth and you're a supporter of Border Angels, just know that your work is crucial. Your work is valuable. So I believe that uh, when it comes to migrant communities and people with disabilities, that true change uh, won't happen uh, unless people are allies and specifically youth get involved to speak up. Now, what does change look like? Change means viewing something like seeing the kids in cages and being able to even go beyond kind of the surface level of knowledge and saying, wow, I'll bet you that in addition to just being kids, there's probably a lot of kids with disabilities in that group. So in other words, being able to look at a problem or being able to look at an issue and kind of thinking beyond just the surface level and being able specifically in this case with disability, being able to um, take things and, and, and view uh, disability as, as part of that. So when you look at certain things like Title 42 or MMP, identifying that not only are those things problematic, but probably, pro probably uh, problematic from a disability perspective as well. Expand your thinking to know um, that, that it requires more action than we probably even knew. Yes, thank you for reminding me to not stay silent. Um, that is how this the talk came about, um, reminding me and I'm relearning again to be aware of the times that I myself have been a part of the problem. Um, and, and so when you invite us to be part of changing the narrative and being an ally, um, you know, recognizing we all have our biases, but we can prevent them through through awareness. And so that's why it's very important to be aware of the times that we ourselves are engaged in uh, hurtful conduct. Um, you know, when when uh, talking about training officers, uh, Border Patrol, for example, and how to treat someone else, the other, right? This otherism, as you mentioned, it's it's based on fear and, and oftentimes, sadly, on hate. Um, but creating fear of the other, in particular in agencies that have so much power over migrants, for example, as you mentioned, the kids in cages, we've seen time and time again, the mistreatment of people because they are uh, treated as the other rather than just another human being, another sibling in this world. Um, we ha used to have a an agent of Border Patrol, um, the chief of Border Patrol train their officers by creating a, an, an imagery of, of someone that is invading the country, someone that is in your kitchen at three in the morning, um, a criminal. Right. When in reality, asylum seekers are knocking at our doors, asking to be let in, willing to turn themselves in and be extremely vetted as anyone going through an immigration process is. And not only that, but they're, as you mentioned before, fleeing from something horrible, looking for a chance to survive, looking for a better life. And, and this imagery, this narrative of the other is very problematic um, for, for immigration in particular. So we definitely advocate for 
a more compassionate, merciful imagery of, of folks that are asking for a, an, an opportunity to present their claims to asylum. And as you mentioned, with Title 42 and the Remaining Mexico program that has just restarted again at the border, has those two co in combination have completely shut down the entire asylum system, which means thousands of people are being left out. So something more practical and um, that people can do right now is definitely let the, the Biden administration know that you want the doors open to very vulnerable immigration uh, migrants uh, and, and, and be more compassionate in immigration laws and policies, uh, because right now they're not working and putting more people at risk. Right. Yeah, I mean, we imagine how risky it is for migrants making that journey crossing 12, 13 borders to make it to the U.S. Um, it, it, I can't even imagine what it'd be like to have a, a, a disability and go through that journey, right? Not being able to communicate. Um, a case very, very, um, very um, telling of where we are when it comes to immigration and disability uh, is the, the, a case of a 10 year old with cerebral palsy during the Trump administration that um, because she was undocumented, even though she was only a 10 year old child, um, and, and with all of the challenges uh, medically, was put in a detention uh, for children, detention center with cerebral palsy recovering from an urgent, urgent uh, surgery. Um, we can do better than that. And I think we get there because we still have this fear of each other, because we still have this narrative that we should fear someone that looks different from us, that speaks differently from us or eats different food from us. Um, and so that's why it's very important um, for us to to know uh, about people like you, Alex. Um, I don't know how you stay so positive and so motivational because um, every, I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of yours, um, but you know, it's gotta be, it's gotta be exhausting also at the same time, right? To uplift so many of us and educate so many of us that are not, um, you know, we don't really know um, about this topic very much. Um, we, we have blinders, you know, and uh, are working on, on, on them. But how do, you, how do you stay so positive, Alex? How do, you, how do you do this? Well, thank you for your extremely kind word. I mean, I certainly lean on my faith. My faith is the most important uh, aspect to me and about me. Um, but also daily, I just, I, I remind myself of my purpose and, and quite frankly, the fact that I'm one of the lucky ones. Uh, I was able to come to this country. I was able to receive my education. And certainly I have worked hard and worked tirelessly. Um, and, you know, there's a, a certain amount of, of self-fortitude that goes with that. Uh, but also uh, a strong amount of, of good fortune. And recognizing that I've also been very blessed uh, with a strong amount of mentors and allies um, that has had, that has kept the wind in my sails moving forward and just motivated me to do the same for others. And I would just say that uh, to anyone listening today, um, that chances are if we're involved in this fight and we're really helping um, fight for progress, that we've had people help us along the way and we've had encouragers along the way. We've certainly had allies. And if we have, then it's our responsibility um, to be an ally for others. Uh, I, I think you know that one of the great things that I've gotten to experience in my life that, that I've written about and, and speak about is I got to carry the Olympic torch at one point. And I use the, the illustration that being able to carry the torch was such an incredible, humbling honor. But it also uh, was a clear illustration for me that we are doing the same things in life as being torchbearer, and we're receiving the torch. Look at all the people that came before you and me. Look at all the people that have fought for the rights that we have. Look at all the people that have made all of this progress possible. Um, they essentially have handed the torch to us, and it's our responsibility to hand the torch to future generations, but also to fight for them and to push for them and to advocate for them. Uh, and then it'll be their responsibility to carry it forward to others. Um, so you're right. It is tiring. It is challenging. Um, it certainly requires 
um, a strong amount of self-care and, and, and being able to also watch your mental health, which is, uh, which is an issue in this country that we need to talk about more. Uh, and I think specifically uh, regarding migrant communities and people with disabilities, but that's a whole different discussion. Um, but indeed, um, to know that uh, people have come before me and been allies for me motivates me to be an ally for others. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you for having that conversation with us. We should have more of these conversations. Um, there, there are just, just so much to talk about this. You know, when we talk about diversity and equity and inclusion, um, can you give us a, a few more things that we can be aware about, uh, things that we can do, in the, whether it's in the workplace or uh, in our homes, um, for us to make sure that we are including these voices? Certainly. Well, as I mentioned before, um, I, I am, am blessed. And, and when I say blessed, I mean it. Um, people oftentimes ask me, you know, gosh, don't you wish that you weren't born disabled? And my answer is no. I'm glad. I'm grateful that I have disabilities that I have. Um, uh, because with my life, if I had two arms or two legs, would my life be easier? Certainly but it wouldn't shape me into being the person that I am. It wouldn't give me the perspective uh, that I have. And so with that, um, you know, recognize that everyone has a very special story and everyone has a special narrative. Um, but certainly when you encounter uh, someone that has a disability or someone that is a migrant, chances are uh, if you, again, are not a member of the community, even if you are, recognize that their journey has more more than likely been a little harder been a little more rugged than your average person uh and be an ally for them so even in looking at the two things separately um i can tell you as a as a disabled man that um it really is extremely helpful when i have a non-disabled person ask the restaurant owner hey why aren't your restrooms accessible um, what if someone in a wheelchair wanted to, to come in here? Um, to have an ally advocate for those kinds of issues is really, really uh, a critical thing. Um, likewise, uh, for those that, that, that may know uh, those who are migrants, um, don't be afraid to ask them, what was your experience like? Um, is there anything that you are currently experiencing that I can, that I can help with? Anything that you... Uh, may want to share or anything that I can assist with. It just always helps to have allies, both in terms of uh, hearing our stories, but also, again, being, being able to look at big picture issues, things you see on the news, and to uh, say to yourself, there's, there's a uh, perspective here that probably isn't being talked about uh, that I want to kind of delve into. And, and again, anytime you talk about people in need, uh, people who need compassion, people who are vulnerable, um, there probably is a, a disability component to it and recognizing that there isn't a one size fits all solution uh, and that, that we need to find out directly from those people what their needs are, what their situations are and, and how, how they can use uh, our support. Um, and all of us, all of us um, can do that. All of us can be an ally to someone else. Uh, all of us belong to various groups, so to speak, and all of us have the opportunity um, to, to be able to learn. I'll give you this quick advantage. Even being uh, a male or being a very light-skinned Latino, I recognize that I have privileges that I was, that I, my whole life I've been blind to. But once people start educating me on things that I uh, previously didn't see and didn't, didn't realize, it made me start to ask questions. It made me a better advocate uh, for women, for fellow Latinos, for you name it. Um, it's the kind of thinking that I would like to encourage all of us to have. And again, going back to the youth, um, social change in this country always comes through our young people. And um, I want to continue to encourage them uh, to, to know that they make a difference and we're going to be relying on them more than ever. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Alex. Um, 
you're one of my favorites in the movement. I've made quite a number of um, of um, people that identify as male and don't realize all of their privileges they they have, um, particularly cis uh, cis male. Um, don't not realizing that even that <laughs> has a privilege attached in our society. So I think it's more more than all of these labels that we walk around with or identify with. Also, a commitment to do better, to improve our willingness to be able to listen and and learn and become aware because it's uncomfortable knowing, right? When you point out to me, you know what? You had a conversation and you didn't include uh, disability voices, and it's like, oh my gosh. It's uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable feeling, but we have to have this uncomfortable feeling in order to have the awareness to realize I could do better. I could have spoken up. I could include the voice, um, invite someone like you to to teach us about these things, um, because I'm often left out as well as an undocumented woman in the U.S. Um, you know, I've had other people speak for me, even as I'm standing right next to them. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, I have a voice. Um, if only you would let me exercise it and if you're willing to pay attention to it. And so, you know, with that intersection of, of migration and disability, you know, th those voices have to be very loud in order for us to hear them because it's uncomfortable for us uh, to realize like, oh my goodness, I was not paying attention to that voice. I was ignoring it or speaking for it or over it. Um, and so I think creating these safe spaces to have grace with each other and trust um, and bring these issues. And uh, I appreciate that you trust me enough to bring these things to me and say, you know, there is this voice missing. And I appreciate the grace uh, in bringing that up. And I hope that that is also um, happened to me when I speak up. And, and it has happened a number of times when I've um, told people, hey, what about the undocumented voice? What about the migrants? Like, why is that not part of your program? And I've been lucky enough to also receive grace uh, when that issue is brought up. And so that's another thing we can do. It's, it sounds like it's just, you know, very small to, to um, be kind, be kind to ourselves uh, in real, in having these uncomfortable moments and then be kind to others. But it's so crucial and so important because Otherwise, um, the narrative is just, it can, we've seen it be very horrible. Um, what, and you, you've talked about the youth um, before, and it, we've, we've just charged them with saving the world pretty much. You know, we as adults have kind of messed it up a little for them. And, and now they have all of these number of issues, including climate change and solving immigration and all of these other things that, um, they're being charged with saving the world, um, but how do you how do you see, um, given your knowledge of, of protections in, in the U.S. for a disability, is there hope? Um, I know you're always positive, but is there is there are we moving towards um, a kinder, more inclusive place? You know, um, whenever it gets discouraging from any uh, aspect, I, I just remind myself uh, that things uh, were far different five years ago, 10 years ago, and by all means, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So it is important to stop along the way and value the wins that we've had. So much of what you and I have talked about today weren't even discussion points 10 years ago or less. Um, and so I, I do see progress day by day. Um, you mentioned um, the uncomfortableness of, of, of certain points or, or bringing certain things up. It requires courageous conversations. It requires for us to uh, have the courage uh, to say, hey, I see that there's this discussion being held. Um, well, I've noticed there's a, there's a voice that's being omitted. Um, can we have that voice be included? Um, and it's not comfortable and it's not easy, especially when you know that uh, groups generally, uh, groups and associations uh, tend tend to have uh, good intentions, uh, but we can we can help make their good intentions even better by simply pointing out there's a voice that is missing here, and we're going to continue to hear uh, from people who say 
well, this voice is, is not included and that voice is not included. And it's really a um, two-sided responsibility. It's up to people to point out things that are that are missing and it's up to others to hear them when that's being said and say, okay, what can we do about it? I'm absolutely optimistic about the future and not just in being an optimist in nature and operating in faith. But, you know, I see where um, technology uh, makes uh, transmission of communication faster, easier, uh, puts it in our own hands, really. Uh, what we used to think used to only be something that, that um, TV production companies or movie production companies uh, could do, we are now doing in, in telling our stories on social media, for example. Um, uh, I also think that there, uh, just gosh, even just in the last couple of years, uh, there is more of a, of a diversification uh, within the media that we're consuming, but also um, there seems to be more of a, of a valuing of stories and personal stories and personal experiences. Um, and with anything else, uh, it would be very, it would be very easy and very cynical to say, well, that's just a trend, and you know, people are just being placated, and it, it'll go away. But I really believe that we are educating ourselves enough now that we're providing people uh, perspective they never had before. Um, as long as there are stories, and as long as there are people willing to tell stories, then you'll see progress continually made. Um, are we as far as we need to be? Have we done the things we, we need to do? No, there's a long way to go. There's a long way to go on so many frontiers. Um, but I do think we're getting there. Uh, I do think uh, communication and, and mass media uh, will be crucial in it. But also just the one-on-one -on -one conversations, the one-on-one -on -one courageous conversations uh, to show um, this is my experience. I, I would like to share my experience and I want to hear yours that person-to-person -person contact is really where it starts. Yeah. Um, speaking of person-to-person -person contact, did the pandemic impact your work? Um, I mean, no, we're doing this remote today, but yeah. how, how did the, or did the, the, the pandemic impact your work? It, it was very impactful. Um, as you know, for a living, um, I give presentations and I speak at schools and conferences and in public uh, places, uh, in addition to writing and publishing and editing. Um, that latter part, um, I was able to pretty much keep up with, uh, but I did have to shut down my business for about a year uh, because there were no um, public events to be able to present at. Um, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Within the disability community, I have known people that have been advocates for uh, virtual uh, uh, communication for about 20 years. And the message that we've always heard is it's not possible, it's not cost effective, uh, work from home is out of the question. Uh, you must physically be in an office in order to work uh, or, or in a workspace. Um, and now with um, the pandemic pretty much putting all of us at the same level, because we were all enduring it and we all had the same challenges associated with it. Um, it quite frankly, it was a little bit humorous to me uh, to all of a sudden see uh, uh, work from home and virtual communication uh, be embraced uh, when this is a concept that I first started hearing about 20 years ago. Um, but it is what it is. Um, it did impact uh, you know, my business and my way of life um, but I was um, glad when, as a, as a society, we did begin to embrace uh, virtual uh, communications. Um, and that's just, that's just the way it is. Um, progress in general will never be as timely or as fast as we want it to be. But we just got to keep pushing uh, and make sure that, uh, that our voices are, are heard. Uh, I will add, too, um, the other way... Um, that the pandemic uh, impacted uh, me is just as, as, as a person with a disability, um, uh, some things came to light in the sense of um, when the grocery store shelves were just ransacked by people that were 
basically hoarding food um, because they were very panicked, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, um, that, that, that we were going to run out of food. Uh, for someone like me, who um, I'll give you this illustration, because of the prosthetic arms that I wear, um, I, I can only carry so many groceries at a time. Uh, and so I really have to kind of uh, plan out my my trips to the grocery store. Um, I, I'm 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 an in-person grocery store kind of guy. I don't do I don't do um, uh, online ordering of groceries. Maybe I will. Uh, but when the pandemic uh, first started, uh, I was one of those that was finding, you know, wow, like it's hard for me if the last remaining roll of toilet paper is on the top shelf. I can't reach it. And imagine if you're in a wheelchair or imagine if you're on crutches, uh, even something that's accessible to me um, isn't accessible to them. And so uh, it became a very, a very uh, visible uh, reality. Now, again, it takes time for things to catch up. What I saw most of our uh, grocery retailers do, uh, including uh, my neighborhood one in, in East Village is to have specific hours for people with disabilities and for the elderly to be able to come uh, and shop and not have to deal with a whole horde of people. Um, it required for us to, again, be vocal and share through social media, through conversations that we were experiencing this for uh, that sort of solution um, to be engaged. Um, this didn't impact me, but I know for a lot of people that have disabilities, uh, if they had uh, some sort of respiratory or um, uh, just some sort of cardiovascular issue, uh, they were even more vulnerable, uh, which was why it was even more critical uh, that we mask up. And as I, as, as I personally tried to um, communicate uh, to all of my networks, um, when, you, when you are wearing your mask, you are not only protecting yourself, but you're protecting people who are really vulnerable because they have illnesses and, and issues that you can't even see. Um, and that's been a big discussion within the disability community. So it's been hard, it's been tough, um, but like most things in this country, anything that will um, unify us and be a, a shared experience uh, can only have positive outcomes. Yes, uh, we're in it together. We kept hearing and it definitely became true. Um, you know, so with kindness and grace and a place of love, um, I think it's going to take every single one of us to, to we, we learned that, um, I guess it the hard way, <laughs> we learned that we do need every single one of us uh, to be in it together, to be able to um, move forward together. It's going to take all of us. Um, and so um, I'm sorry that you, you've had to go through through all of that. Um, Thank you for, for telling us again, these things that we, we take for granted, we don't see, we, we take the last roll of toilet paper, not knowing how that would impact someone else. Um, so I appreciate those illustrations very much. Um, is there anything we haven't talked about yet? I know um, we opened it up for questions for people online, uh, but is there anything else, uh, Alex, that in the, in the next uh, few minutes that we have? I think we've covered most of everything. I would just encourage people um, just to uh, uh, continue to uh, look to uh, organizations like the one that I've created, uh, the Alex Montoya Foundation, uh, which they can find online there, uh, alexmontoya.org. Um, please utilize this as a resource to be able to um, have these um, courageous conversations and be able to serve as a resource for schools, businesses, uh, places of faith, organizations, you name it. Um, and, and continue to to uh, be an ally to us and allow us to be an ally uh, to you. Um, but that's really where it starts is, is the more that we are an ally to each other, uh, the more that you will see uh, progress in all ways. Thank you, thank you Alex, for that. I don't think that there's um, any uh, questions online. Um, but again, please visit www.alexmontoya.org, alexmontoya.org, um, for information, 
Um, but please also buy one of the books. Um, the children's book is just the cute, it's, it has the cutest illustrations as well. And I know that just, uh, it became, I think a mural in one of the schools here locally in San Diego. So congratulations on that. Thank um, you, that was, that was this week uh, at Valbo Elementary, uh, which is uh, located between uh, Barrio Logan and uh, kind of on the cusp of uh, National City Southeastern uh, San Diego, uh, dedicated uh, a mural uh, based on one of the pieces of our work uh, in my children's book. So uh, again, you asked me earlier, uh, do we have reasons to to be optimistic and to believe that uh, progress is being made? Uh, you have to be able to take um, little things like that, even though that wasn't little, that was uh, grand in so many ways, uh, but to take things like that and realize that um, people are listening and people are hearing. And, and again, um, to know that it's going to be kids that see uh, that mural each and every day, uh, you have to believe that, um, that the seed is being planted uh, in a positive way. Yes, it takes courage to be an ally and to raise uh, your own voice um, for, for yourself, for your family, for your community. Um, so I want to thank you, Alex, for being that brave voice time and time again um, and making some of us feel uncomfortable um, by becoming aware. And so I appreciate um, all of the learnings very much. I appreciate the love, uh, the grace that you consistently show. Um, and I want to encourage other, one, other people to also become uncomfortable, also be courageous. Uh, take a page from your books, Alex. Um, I don't know how you do all, all the things that you do, but um, you're very much appreciated, very much loved. Um, I cannot thank you enough for this conversation. Um, and as we learned today, we can all do something. All of us together can do something to make sure that all voices are being included. It can be in our personal lives. It could be at work. It could be in the marketplace. Um, it can be, you know, shopping, as you mentioned earlier, and be aware and conscious of, of our actions and how that might impact someone else. Um, or it could be our business policies as well. Um, and so I'll leave the last word to you. I, I don't believe we have any, any questions. Okay. Well, thank you again. I, I am extremely grateful uh, to you and Border Angels for uh, giving us this platform today. Um, you just mentioned something, you know, right now in terms of um, uncomfortable conversations, or, or as I also call them, uh, uh, courageous conversations. Um, it's kind of like going to the gym, right? When you work out, um, you're not doing it because it's 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 simply pleasurable. Um, working out, exercise. Uh, requires some discomfort, uh, requires some, some soreness. Uh, but you know whether you're running, lifting weights, swimming, doing yoga, whatever the case may be, you know that in those moments of discomfort, you're doing something good for your body, for your health, for your mental health, everything. Um, and it's the same in our world. Um, when we have these courageous conversations, when we allow ourselves to be vulnerable and uncomfortable and bring up topics um, that, 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 that are uncomfortable, you're a thousand percent correct, good things will come from it. Um, again, I, I'm, I am blessed more than I can say uh, to be a migrant, to be a person with a disability, uh, but to also have um, allies along the way that uh, recognize that it wasn't going to be an easy journey and it wasn't going to be uh, a journey that, um, that I could necessarily make alone. And so I would challenge everyone to just identify um, people within their own lives and then even just people in the community overall um, to recognize that we can make a difference uh, in their futures. And when we do, uh, we are opening up doors for uh, people to just make our lives better, make the city better, make the country better. Um, we want to contribute. We want to make this world better. Uh, but in order to do that, uh, it takes all of us and um, we should, we should really uh, be reflective of the, the progress we've made and know that we have a long way to go, but we can do anything. Thank you again, Thank you. Alex. Um, and check out Border Angels also on our page. We'll be putting uh, the recording uh, on YouTube, mm -hmm. on our website, and we'll get it out um, in our newsletter as well. So thank you for everyone that's uh, that's paying attention to these issues um, and look forward to our next uh, conversation. 
Cannot thank you enough, Alex. Un abrazote. Hasta luego. Gracias. Thank you all.